Disassemblers such as Ida Pro and Ghidra are indispensable reverse engineering tools, but learning how to use these tools effectively starts by learning how to read assembly. I get asked a lot about how best to approach learning Ida or Ghidra, and this video aims to help answer that question. In this video, we'll discuss how programs go from source code to machine code executable directly by the CPU, and then back to something more human readable with tools like Ida or Ghidra. By the end of this video, you'll have a much better understanding of how disassemblers recover code and why learning assembly in your reverse engineering journey is so important. I hope you're enjoying these videos. If so, please take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button. Ready to dive into a full course covering the basics of Ida or Ghidra? Well, I've got great news for you. I have two full courses available on Pluralsight to help get you started. The link for both courses is in the description below, so check them out. Okay, let's get started. For today's demonstration, I'm going to use some sample code that I have available on one of my GitHub repositories. I'm going to choose switch.c. There are plenty of programs here, and I've more or less picked one at random. The goal here isn't so much to understand what's going on in the code, but just to allow me to illuminate or highlight the process that occurs when we take source code, such as you see here, compile it into machine code, and then use a tool like Ida or Ghidra in order to reverse engineer that to recover that code. So you can see with this program, we can identify the entry point. There is a local variable declared I, there's a print statement through the call to puts and a call to scanf, which, which gets user input. Um, there's a switch and then there's a call to a function called large switch. Uh, and this has a switch here. And this contains a much larger switch. That is, it contains more case statements than the previous. And again, our, our goal here isn't really to understand the logic of this program, but just the process. I'm going to download this program then. And I'm going to save the source code on my desktop. Now, you're free to modify the source code, of course. That's the point of having source code, is that we write a program in the language of our choosing, and then we allow it to be executed by the environment in which it's designed to be executed in. So, for example, we have a program here written in C. We will compile it using Microsoft Visual Studio, and then it will be executable directly by the operating system, the Windows operating system. Okay, so how does that source code, though, turn into something that's executable by the computer? Well, I have the developer command prompt open, and the easiest path is to use CL, which is the Microsoft compiler at the command prompt, in order to compile that program into executable output. That is, we have an executable program, switch.exe. Now, there are a number of intermediary steps that happen here. Namely, that source code is translated into machine code, and any dependencies, particularly through libraries, are also linked into the binary. This helps the program when it needs to call code that it doesn't define, such as a puts or a gets, as you saw earlier, by linking that library code into the executable. So what's happened to that source code now that it's gone through the process of compilation? Well, here we have our executable, our output file. Let's right click on that and we'll choose HXD as our hex editor. The hex editor is going to allow us to just view the raw content of this file. And there's going to be some information in here that will be recognizable if you're familiar with the PE or portable executable file format, such as the first couple of bytes, 4D5A, those are the magic bytes, and you know strings here, such as the what's called the DOS stub. If you're not familiar with the PE file structure, don't worry about it at this time. We don't need to focus too much on it. Now, we can scroll down this file a little bit, and what will happen is that the code that source code is going to be compiled into machine code. That code is going to be stored in different segments in the file. With Microsoft, that segment is typically called .text and will be stored at an offset of 400 hex from the beginning of the file. Now, keep in mind, this changes a little bit when this program is loaded into memory and executed. But for right now, all we need to know or be able to recognize is that that source code, those nice local variables and function definitions and switch statements, have taken on this binary state. These byte values now represent all of the code that we just compiled. Now, as a reverse engineer or malware analyst, we don't typically get the source code to analyze. It's this machine code at this binary state when we encounter the samples that we need to investigate. So while we could begin to understand and read this machine code, as it's defined by the CPU architecture that it's running on, you could see where this could get quite time consuming and maybe even a little bit tedious. So that's where tools like Ida and Ghidra come into play. 
they're going to help us to recover this information into something that's a little more human readable. For this example, I'm just going to use the latest version of IDA Free. You can see that in this project view, it already has my executable switch.exe. So if this wasn't already there, if I hadn't already opened it, you could just say new and disassemble a new file. You'll get the file selection dialog to choose that executable or go. And then you can drag and drop the file, that binary, into IDA's interface. Once we select the project, it'll take a moment here. You'll get a load new file dialog. You can see this is where IDA is recognizing the portable executable file format so that it understands the structure of the file to identify metadata as well as where it can load the executable code. Once it's done, I'm going to make one slight modification to the interface. Under Options General, I'm going to enable line prefixes and we'll turn on seven bytes of opcodes. So you can see that those two settings there just my display and then I'm going to close the output window at the very bottom. Okay, now we can see that IDA has parsed that executable file, that PE file. It's found the entry point, it's begun the process of disassembly, and now it's presenting that code to us in the form of disassembly, which is just the process of taking that machine code and converting it back into something that is human readable. We're really just looking at assembly here. Now, you'll notice that I turned on line prefixes. These are going to be virtual addresses off to the side here, and then opcode bytes. This actually represents the raw byte value for each instruction. IDA is going to act like an operating system loader. That is, when we're looking at a program disassembled in IDA, it's going to pretend as though it's been loaded into memory for execution. So if you recall the text section offset that I mentioned earlier, in memory, during execution, it'll be at an offset of 1,000 hex. So the image base for these executables, that is the base address that you'll find them in memory, is going to be by default 400,000 hex, and the beginning of the code then will be at an offset of 1,000 hex from there. Okay, so why do we talk about all of this? Well, virtual memory and the difference between an executable on disk and in memory is very important. But mainly, I just wanted to continue to show you the importance of tools like IDA to help you in recovering this information. If you look at the virtual address where we're currently located, 401080, this instruction, push EBP, has an opcode of hex 55. This instruction is at an offset of 80 hex bytes from the beginning of this section. We can now find this in our hex editor. If we start at the beginning of the text section on disk, which is 400 hex, and we go 80 bytes in. There's our opcode byte, hex 55. Not quite sure? Well, let's continue to look at the bytes. Hex 55, then 8B, EC, 83, EC, 08, so on. We go back to IDA, and you can see there's hex 55, 8B, EC, 83, EC, 08. Now, if that was a little confusing, that's fine. This is just something that you'll learn to do as you become more proficient with reverse engineering. Again, the importance here is just to simply recognize, really the importance here is just to recognize what tools like IDA Pro and Ghidra are doing. Now, can it get better than this? Well, that's a great question. And up until recently, at least with IDA, the answer was depends. Depends on if you're willing to purchase a license. Now with the free versions of IDA, it does have limited decompilation support, the decompiler. This is also considered the easy button because it is function F5. If you press that key and click through any of the prompts, IDA will turn this back into something that looks a little bit more like C. Although you may notice we have a series of if, else if statements rather than the switch statements that we had originally. And that could be caused by two things. One, either the process of compilation, or two, the process of decompilation. Compiling programs from source is a lossy process. That is, we lose information about variable names, function names, and even data and control structures because there may not be an equivalent capability at that low level once it gets to machine code. So in the process of recovering that, the disassembler only has the machine code that's present. And sometimes it has to make some inferences about the underlying control structures or patterns of code that it's uncovering. While the structures here may look different, they're functionally equivalent to the original program. So lots of things that we could talk about. And hopefully if you're not real familiar with IDA, this is helping you to illuminate and understand why 
learning reverse engineering has a pretty steep initial learning curve. I would encourage you not to just jump into IDA, but to formulate a plan. Come up with objectives and a learning path that can help you along the way to maximize the time that you're spent and hopefully minimize your frustrations. Reverse engineering is a challenging and very rewarding profession though. And while you may run into some frustrations, I would encourage you to stick with it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Comments are open and I'm easily accessible across the internet as the Cyber Yeti. And as always, keep exploring.